Okay, so this is our second lesson in our probability and stats intro unit in Algebra 2. And it's a, it's a pretty nice one because there's really no calculating involved. It's all vocabulary, and the good news is it's a lot of vocab and experience that you've had in your real life. So it's one of the few times in our class we're talking about something that's not completely foreign to you. All right, so we have ways of collecting information, and the three that we're going to talk about today our surveys, experiments, and observational studies. So a survey, and you've all taken surveys, I know you've taken like 20 surveys in advisory alone over the last few years. It's a way of getting information from a population or sometimes just a sample, depending on how big your population is, right? So if I'm trying to find out um, how everybody in Illinois feels about a politician, it's probably not feasible for me to go and literally ask every single person in Illinois how they feel about that politician. So we would do some sampling and we would survey some of them. And this is where a lot of people um, bring up issues they have with how experiments are designed or how surveys are handled because they will say, well, who did you survey? And how did you design that? And what does the survey look like? And did you lead them to certain opinions because of the way you wrote your survey? So there's, there's a lot of skepticism surrounding this these concepts and that's actually part of our fun today and during class I'm sure we'll have a very lively debate <laughs> about you know what creates bias in surveys and what creates bias and how we handle our experiments and and obviously bias is bad we'll talk about that but um, we'll talk about times in our life where maybe we've experienced bias and we felt like a survey was trying to get you to answer a certain way because they want certain things to come out of your answers. So we'll talk about that. Um, taking a poll to learn who's going to vote in the upcoming election. That's a survey. So it doesn't have to be a piece of paper. That's what some kids think is that it has to be a piece of paper. Not necessarily. Observational study is kind of weird, though. Um, it's where you observe. And that's it. Like you don't do anything to influence, you just sit back and you watch. In in class, we refer to this as um, the stalker method, because <laughs> you're just kind of sitting in the back, just watching. Um, there's nothing wrong with that in many cases, but some of these examples are pretty weird. And my favorite thing is to, when you guys get to the questions on your test, where you have to tell me whether you should do a survey or an observational study or an experiment, and some of the answers that come out of you guys, uh, they're just interesting. I'll put it that way. We'll discuss later in class. All right, so here's a good example. Um, you're obser observing a group of 100 people, and you notice um, that 50 of them who have been taking a certain treatment, and you're going to figure out if they're behaving differently than the other 50. So that's kind of a weird example. I don't like that example. We'll probably change it in class. But um, this is the one I like to use. I, I'm like an old stickler for um, niceties in public, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in the parking lot in my car, and I'm going to watch the front door, and I'm going to watch how many people hold the door for everybody else or for their person behind them and how many people just let it slam in the other person's face. So I'm not influencing that in any way. Um, I'm just watching it and seeing it and recording my results, right? Okay, an experiment is where I intentionally do something to change the outcome to a portion of my group. So we're going to talk later about something called the control group and the treatment group. And if you're designing an experiment, a true experiment, you need to have both of those things. You need to have a control group so you can compare if the treated group has anything different going on. If everybody gets the medicine, you know, how are you going to know if it made a difference, if they're all being affected? So this question, I want you to tell me whether it's an experiment or an observational study. It's not a survey. And then I want you to tell me if it's control, if there, you can identify the control and treatment group. <clears throat> um, and then we'll talk about bias if there is any. So let's just talk about control and treatment group if it's an experiment, okay? So this one's already done for you. Um, 20 ducks, half of which are domesticated, and you compare their weights. So I didn't do anything to make these ducks fat or skinny. I just found 20 of them. And I found, I made sure that 10 of them were wild ducks and 10 of them were like ducks on a farm. And I weighed them. So this is an observational study. Yes, I had to go find them, but I didn't do anything to them. I just, they are what they are. And for, 
this treated group. Ignore that. That's really for experiment. Um, the point is, can you tell me that that's an observational study? So, again, this next one's done for us, so that's kind of lame. But it says, um, you want to know how students and parents feel about school uniforms. So they're claiming the best way to do this is to call for a survey. And don't worry about random sampling stuff. We'll talk about that more later. But I think a survey makes a lot of sense, whether it's a Google Classroom survey, whether it's a survey sent through the report cards, through Skyward, a literal piece of paper they have to fill out at registration. During class, we'll talk about how we can administer the survey and who gets it. And is it appropriate to give to the entire population, or should we just be giving it to um, a sample? So we'll, we'll talk all about that. And I, I can't wait to see what things you guys come up with, because you're pretty, pretty clever when it comes to this. All right, so these examples, these are not done for us for once. So we're going to kind of go through these. And again, I don't really care about control and treatment group unless it's an experiment. So we're going to find 300 students, split them into two groups. We're going to make one group practice basketball three times a week, and then the other group will not practice basketball. And then after three months of doing this, we're going to interview them to see if they have changed the way they feel about school. This is most definitely an experiment. Because I'm splitting them into two groups, and I'm forcing one group to play basketball. So the control group would be the ones who don't play any basketball. Because typically, most, you know, the average high school student doesn't play basketball three times a week, right? So, no basketball. The experiment or treated group, treat, <laughs> um, are the b-ball player ones. The ones who do are forced to play basketball three times a week. It's kind of a lame experiment because there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it, clearly. We'll talk about this more in class. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. Um, is there bias? If this is all I'm doing, and I'm just randomly splitting people into groups, I'm just selecting them randomly, while that is, the, the choosing of it is very unbiased, um, there's things we could do to bias it, maybe by accident. Like, uh, how do I choose these 300 kids? Am I going by GPA? Am I, how exactly do I choose these 300? And we're going to talk about that. And usually what kids come up with is um, if they're trying to avoid bias, they usually do like alphabetical listing and then use a random number generator who picks 300 names, which it is completely random. So you're not necessarily choosing, you know, the athletes, the non-athletes, the children who already don't like school. Or maybe that's the direction you want to go. Maybe there are 300 kids in this school who are failing everything. And you just can't figure out what to do with them. So you take those kids, that's your population, and you make half of them practice basketball and half of them not. And you see if there's a difference. That is a different experiment, but that would be okay. That would be a fine experiment. In fact, that might be an awesome experiment. Maybe we should try that. All right, we have 100 students. Um, but I know a lot of these 100 students, 50 of them are on the math team. I didn't put them on the math team. They just are on the math team. Um, and I'm going to compare their grade point averages to the kids who are not on math team. So this is called an observational study. Okay. So I'm not doing anything to either of the children's groups. I'm not making them do something. I'm not trying to influence their grade point average. I used to coach math teams, so I could tell you their GPAs are probably pretty good, right? But... Uh, it's an observational study. All right, so correlation and causation. This causes a lot of problem in the news, the media, because they use the word correlation quite a bit. And in people's minds, that means one thing when it really doesn't. So correlation means that one event happens, means the other event is likely to happen. Okay. Causation is because one event happened, the other one is directly affected, and it does happen. So I know those sound similar, right? Correlation is like a little wishy-washy. It's like, eh, it might happen. <laughs> so we're going to determine whether things are causation or correlation. So children who live in very large houses get larger allowances than children who live in small houses. So they're saying right here that this is a correlation, that if you looked at the data, you might find, according to the data, that children who live in larger houses get larger allowances. So if you, as a scientist, you'd think of that and say, well, what's the reason for that? If a parent makes more money, they're more likely to give 
trickle down to the, the children, give them a larger allowance. If a, a parent lives in a smaller house, maybe that's because they don't have a lot of extra money and they can't afford to give them extra allowance. So there's many, many reasons. And that's why we have to be careful about the correlation versus causation thing. If, it, if this was a causation, that would mean every single person who lives in a large house gets a larger allowance than someone who lives in a small house simply because they live in a large house. And we know that's not true. I've met very many parents who have plenty of money to throw around, but that money is not going anywhere near their kids, right? All right, this one. Everyone fights over this one. If I jog in the rain, I will get sick. Correlation, causation. Uh, we're going to call that a correlation. And I know I'm going against probably what your mom and grandma or whoever told you. <laughs> They're... <sighs> Unless you're, like, getting pneumonia... <laughs> Wet hair does not make you get sick, okay? So unless you're sitting out in the freezing rain for hours, running a marathon, and then you never get dry, <laughs> and you're prone to pneumonia, that would simply be a correlation, okay? Sorry, Grandma. You're wrong. All right, studies have shown that eating more fish will improve your math grade. Again, this is a correlation. There would be no way to prove that your improved math grade was contingent on the fact that you ate fish we might see a trend. That's called a correlation. All right. This one, if you lose a library book, you're going to pay a fine. That is a causation. The fact that you lost the book means you pay the fine. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. This is my favorite one. Reading a diet book will make you lose weight. <laughs> no. Um, now, first of all, I don't even think that's true. But if it was true, if the data show that people who read diet books tended to lose more weight, that would simply be a correlation. The fact that you were reading a book did not make you lose weight. I'm sure if there was a correlation, we could scientifically pull out some aspects of reading the book that may have caused them to lose weight. Um, but reading the book itself is not it. If I miss a day of school, I will not get the perfect attendance award. That is a causation. The fact that you missed school took you out of the list of kids with perfect attendance. So causation. Owning an, an ex owning an expensive car will make me earn lots of money. Again, I don't think so. Uh, but again, that's a, that's a correlation. As a scientist, we can look into details. You know, why is it that people who own expensive cars tend to make more money? Well, that's kind of chicken and the egg, isn't it? If you make a lot of money, maybe you buy a more expensive car. Like duh. But just because I happen to purchase an expensive car doesn't mean I'm going to magically make more money. There's no causation there. That's the point. All right, so that was a super short lesson on observational study versus experiment versus using a survey. We're going to talk more about this. And like I said, I just I can't wait for the conversations in class because this is one of my favorite lessons to teach you guys. Just laughing at each other and figuring out what weird things you're going to come up with and how we can disprove them to each other. It's going to be a good time. I, I really hope you didn't miss this lesson because it's a good one like live in class. It's the best. All right. See ya.